We're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. My name is Ashley Safransky, and I lead marketing here at UConnect. Um, and I just, I really want to thank folks for taking a minute out of their day, um, or a minute, an hour out of their day, just to join us um, on this super, you know, important and timely topic. I think of scaling engagement with career services in a business school environment. Uh, we're super lucky to be joined by two fantastic leaders, Tony and Jean. And I'll let them introduce themselves here in just a second. Um, I did just want to quickly mention that we are recording today's session, and I will email it out to everyone, um, and you can expect to get it probably tomorrow morning. Um, and I, I also want to encourage people to ask questions, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat, use the Q&A box. Um, I do have a handful of questions for Tony and Jean just to help kickstart the discussion, uh, but we'll leave the last 15 to 20 minutes for open Q&A. So please, yeah, please go ahead and submit those and we'll keep an eye on that and get, do our best to get through all of them. So I think those are all my little housekeeping notes um, and I'm going to let Tony and Jean introduce themselves. So Tony, do you want to, you want to get us started? Yes. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here today. My name is Tony Rohr. I am currently the Executive Director of the Career Management Center at the Rady School of Management at UC San Diego, and I have been in this role just over a year. Uh, I, in my previous roles, I've been in higher ed career services, um, started about 23 years ago. I've worked with um, solely undergrad populations in private women's colleges, uh, large universities, um, and I've spent the majority of my um, career with business schools, and I've worked previously for the Duke MBA Career Management Center, and I spent 10 years at Arizona State University, eight years with WP Carey School of Business, so nice to see some of my former colleagues, hello April, on the call today, and um, a lot of the scaling and what I'll talk about today, you know, a lot of that work started at Arizona State. The business school there is the largest business school in the country with 16,000 undergrads and about 1,500 grad students. Um, and I've brought that over to the Rady School. And we have a smaller population here. It's only graduate business students, uh, a little under 1,000 students we have, but I have a much smaller staff. So Scaling engagement is still very important to us here at Rady School. So nice to see you all. Great. Thanks, Tony. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gene Ree. I'm the executive director of Moore Career Services, which is the career center for the Lundquist College of Business at the University of Oregon. Go Ducks. Um, just really quickly on my background, I've been in career services for about uh, like 13 years now. Started off at Georgetown's MBA Career Center and then moved west to Pomona College. So I left MBA, went to liberal arts undergrads for a short while, and then to Chapman University in Orange County, California, back to the business school, working with undergrads as well as graduate students. Um, I took a bit of a left turn, uh, left higher education, um, at least the institution side, and I went to work uh, at a ed tech company called VMOC. Uh, some of you might have heard that there. It's a um, uh, resume uh, improvement platform, um, and uh, but then decided, hey, I, I, I want to get back to students, and so came uh, to the University of Oregon uh, five years ago. So I've been leading the team here um, at the University of Oregon's Business School Career Center, and it's been a fantastic time, and uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Excellent. All right. Thanks, you too, and just thanks so much again for for joining us. Um, and I know Zach, my colleague Zach was in the chat, just um, Tony and Jean are also great Uconnect partners. So we appreciate them. And he wanted to throw their links to their platforms just in the in the chat in case you're curious. So I think it's important to, for, to kind of set up this whole entire conversation with some definitions, or at least how you two think about defining certain things. So I think the first would be, how are each of you de either defining or thinking about engagement? What does that mean to you? Uh, I think it's a super important question because I think as we all talk about the work that we do and we think about the metrics and the data, it's very hard to measure something if you haven't really defined it first, right? And um, as I mentioned, I've been in career services for a very long time. So I think that has changed over time. And I do think there are still a lot of traditional 
places that define engagement with the career office as one-on-one -on -one career appointments or maybe workshop attendance. And I think as I think about engagement, I would broaden that definition to be any engagement with career content, career staff, career capabilities. So whether it's a faculty teaching uh, resumes in a class, you know, that's engagement with a career competency. And so I think we need to look broader at engagement and, you know, we'll talk about the scaling of that, but I think defining it broader is important because not everyone needs a one-on-one -on -one appointment or not everyone can come into a one-on-one -on -one appointment, but they could engage with your content through an email newsletter or on your website or in other ways. And I think if we can capture that engagement in different ways, then we can show sort of a broader um, impact that we're having on the students. Yeah, for, for me, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the million dollar question, I think, that, that many of us have been trying to, to figure out an answer. And it's, you know, similarly, it's like, it's what, what keeps us up at night. Um, you know, engagement, it, it could be defined as, you know, simply an opportunity to, to meet with a student. I think it's how do you use that time? And I think if, if we can impart some knowledge but also gain some knowledge in that in that interaction, you know, like as as an advisor, you meet and, and you you talk to a student or in a class session, you talk to a student and you impart some knowledge. But I think there's an opportunity for us to gain some information from from that experience from the students. And so I, I look at that as part of this idea of defining engagement. And I think, Tony, what you're saying about, you know, how things have changed, I think you're 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 you know spot on with that, where like even when I when we look at our 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 mission statement for the Career Center, we talk about leading this effort. That's not just all of our responsibility in the Career Center, because, I mean, let's be honest and real, like these conversations are happening everywhere. Um, you know, just like you connect talks about career everywhere, like that's the truth. It is happening everywhere. And it's not just the Career Center, it's not just our events. And so how can you start to look at that in its totality to figure out what the engagement means? And so so Tony, I totally agree with what you're what you're saying there, and in, in, in how to define it, and, and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more details of, of what that is. But at a, at a high level, that's that's what I think about. Yeah, I th it's such an important call out too, Jean, about you know, there's this how are they engaging with the career services team and related resources specifically, but how are you know the broader ecosystem at your institution and where we you know career conversations are happening. Um, I think I think it's a, a really important call out, like I mentioned. So what about this element of scale? What does scale mean? You know, scaling can also it can mean different things to different people or based on what your goals or what you're trying to to address. Um, can you touch on just this element of scale as well? I've got a, a pretty simple yeah. kind of definition, I suppose, is it's, you know, how do we increase whatever that output is and you know if we're talking about engagement it's is how are you increasing that at a faster pace or or doing better than what your resources allow and you know when we talk about career services or anything in higher education like we we will never be appropriately resourced we will never have enough to to manage all the students i think about tony and asu 16000 like you're giving me nightmares so i'm going to stop thinking about that but <laughs> Um, but you're, you're never going to have that. So how I think it's imperative for us to thinking about um, what are the different places that what are the different resources or ways that we can um, get information into the hands of students. Uh, um, you know, so you start thinking about technology, you start thinking about influencers, people who can share your message one to many as opposed to just one on one, because that's that's just impossible. So. Yeah, I think I would add on to that. Totally agree that when we're looking at scale, we're trying to find a way to get all of the information and all of the content and all of the support to every student. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that if you have five people? One, I mean, I've talked to people who are the only person in their career center, one person. You know, how do you do that if you're just one person or five people, or even if you're 30 people, but you have thousands and thousands of students, right? And so that's the that's where the scaling comes in, where you have to really think about 
Um, how are you trying to engage the students? What do they need? What's the content they need? What's the support they need? And then how can you do that in an efficient way mm -hmm. that makes it accessible for everyone at any point in time? So just like what Jean mentioned as well, like using technology, how do we use that better in a way to get that information to students when they need it um, and not just eight to five when the office might be open, you know? So I think in terms of scaling, because agreed, we're never going to be fully resourced, right? If, you know, otherwise you would need a career advisor for every student, you know, <laughs> they all need that help. But, um, you know, limited staff, limited resources, limited budget, how are you going to do more with what you have? And I think if you are really intentional about the scaling and how you do that, then you can reach all of those students in a way that is impactful to them. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I think Tony, that sets up my next question for you specifically. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you have a pretty defined or specific engagement model that you leverage at UC at Rady School of Management and you've used previously. Can you kind of give an overview of that? Yeah, sure. So again, it kind of started with defining engagement and helping people understand that engagement goes beyond the one-on-one -on -one appointments. And in thinking about that, kind of the thought process was, what are core career capabilities that all students need? So what are the things that we might be delivering one-on-one -on -one to students, but we're telling them the same thing. And so it's like over and over, how can we scale that? So we don't have to tell every individual student that. And so we think about core career capabilities like resume writing, cover letters, interviewing, um, job negotiation, right? All those core career skills that students need and then find a way to deliver those to the masses. Right, so workshops is one way, group engagement. You can get more students, more times. You know, Now that we can do things hybrid or online, we can even reach more students um, at different times of the day and different days of the week. Um, deliver the content on your website. So this is one place where you connect is really beneficial to us is that we have built those career skill communities on our website and all of the content goes there. So if a student needs resume help at midnight on a Friday night, they can get all of that information on the website. So anything that is a core skill that everyone's gonna need a foundation in, find a way to deliver that at a group scale. And then, you have some needs that are more targeted. So for example, we teach everyone about behavior-based interviewing, but our master's in business analytics students need to know how to do technical interviewing. And that's not something everybody needs. So we look at a way to deliver that content in a way that we can reach that whole group. And so typically we do that, we could do a targeted workshop. So we could do interview, you know, technical interviewing workshop. Um, or we partner with the club. So we have a data analytics club. We might partner with the club to bring in a speaker or to do a workshop for the club members, or we might bring in alumni and do a technical interviewing panel. But again, we're reaching a smaller audience that's targeted, but it's still at the group scale. And then when we get to the one-on-one -on -one coaching, what we're really trying to do is use that limited time for really high impact conversations around a student's career strategy, around their very targeted job search, uh, the locations, things like that. So that, you know, the limited amount of one-on-one -on -one time my coaches have, they can spend that really helping the student individualize their approach and all of the other things we have a way to deliver at a broader scale. So. That's how we're looking at it and trying to make sure that we can reach all students for at least those foundational skills and then use the, the more individualized time to build on that. Yeah, like I think that's an important, you know, I think maybe not in all cases, but when we think about scale and, and big group, big group sessions and websites, and it's certainly not about let's not 
you know, one-on-one -on -one appointments aren't valuable um, or worthwhile, but how can you, how can you find more meat? Like how can they have deeper meaning? And I think that's, I think that's really key. Um, I did want to ask because both you and Jean had mentioned, you know, this idea of limited resources, understaffed, and one of the, you know, in your, in your engagement model, Tony, the set, a lot of the group workshops and things like that, the, at the kind of the top two tiers, um, don't necessarily require more, but if you are looking for an additional resource, and in your case, it was you connect, how did you, how did you go about getting buy-in to, you know, fund something that would allow you to have kind of that scaled impact? Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, I'll say, you know, when I was at um, Arizona State, we launched Do Connect there. So I actually had some experience with it already before I came to Rady. Um, but when I got to Rady, my first step was to really assess, you know, what was going on here. And they were in the middle of revamping their website. Um, but what I came to quickly understand was that the, the audience for the website is uh, prospective students. And so that, you know, that happening, you know, gave me a good um, foundation to kind of go to my leadership team, to my dean. Um, I, I built a deck for them starting with, you know, what are the problems we're trying to solve, um, which included, you know, I think a, a problem that a lot of places have, which is so many different resources and so many different places. And how do you bring those all together? to make it so easy for students um, to find what they need. So, you know, that was happening here at Rady. We had Handshake, we had 1220, we had online resources somewhere in a library here, somewhere, you know, on a website here. So that was one easy sort of problem to present. In addition, I think COVID gave us all a bit of a foundation to, to uh, ask for this type of resource because uh, you know, once we weren't in the office anymore, how did students find us? How did they find the information? They couldn't stop by and pick up a copy of your resume template or a handout on interviewing. Um, so being able to show the importance of having this sort of 24-7 digital career center was, again, a, a really good sell. In addition, for programs like mine and probably Jean's, I'm not sure, we have um, flex students. So we have students who come on the weekends and who come in the evenings, and they're not here when the office is open. So again, a really good way to highlight um, the need for something that's not just a website and not just housing something, but something that's dynamic and changing where we can also advertise other opportunities and events and things that are happening. So I went to my leadership team with that information. Here's what I'm looking at. Here's the solution. I've used it before. I know what it can do and here's what it's going to cost. And I kind of was able to present that and um, also am very lucky that my leadership team was really supportive. So yeah, that always helps. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Um, Jean, I know that you and your team leverage a really unique program uh, to help support engagement efforts. Can you speak to that and introduce that for us? Yeah, I, I'd love to. I I love, I love what the team has built and I'm excited to share about it with you. And um, I don't know, hopefully by the end. You know, there might be a few people on the call who um, who might feel comfortable and maybe a little bit more confident to to move in this direction. Because um, I mean, we have a, a team of ten, and it's and I understand that there are plenty of people on the call who you know look at that number and and wish that they had even you know half of that. And and I think that's the reality. And I know Tony brought that up before about you know one person shops and um, but so so to talk about we. We basically we built a career requirement um, for our undergraduate students, and this year alone we've engaged three thousand eight hundred and twenty students through that requirement, and it's all asynchronous assignments um, built into three core courses, uh, and it leverages technology to do much of that. Um, 
And so when I talk about, you know, three core courses, so these are courses that every single Lundquist student has to take, regardless of your specialization, sorry, your concentration or what you want to focus on. They're courses that every single student must take. And so um, we are embedded into, integrated into our BA 101 class, our BA 240 and our marketing 311. And so basically students are, are, are getting career uh, uh, readiness activities in their first year, their second year and their third year. And so as career services professionals, I think everyone understands like, it's like the gym, right? Like you can't go once and declare yourself fit. And if anyone has figured that out, please let me know because I'm trying right now and it's not working. <laughs> However, um, you know, so the repetition is really important. And so you need, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, you, you need the, the, the repetition to, to build this, this sort of career uh, muscle as it were. Uh, all of this um, is really managed by one person and several student staff. And it's integrated into our Canvas, our, which is our learning um, uh, management system. And it, I talked about some of the, the technology platforms that, that we're um, also leveraging there. Um, and I'll, I can share a little bit more about you know, assignments as, as we you know, progress through the meeting. But, um, but yeah, so, so that's basically what we've got. And you know, the outcomes, I think, have been fantastic. Like um, Students are telling us that, you know, what, 76% said that they would not have done these activities had it not been for this program. Like three out of four students are doing stuff. And I, I think that number is incredible. I love it. Um, you know, it's a required thing. And 77% and are saying that they would recommend it to a friend, like, and it's required. So I think we're, you know, we've, we've, um, figured something out that's, that's working well for our students. And again, like, I understand that it's, it's not, it, it's not for every school, it's not for every program. And, and there are lots of, um, potential challenges and things to, um, to overcome, but, um, yeah, I, um, I'm excited about the way that we are able to share education, career education with our students in this way. So, um, yeah, that's, those numbers are remarkable, Gene. I think, you know, that could, that's a number of students who may not have ever engaged with your office. I have a couple of follow-up questions for you. Um, you know, faculty are like kind of an elusive group. I think that many um, career centers would say can be difficult um, or challenging to engage with. Can you speak a little bit deeper, like deep into how you went about getting the buy-in from the faculty or department chairs or whoever you needed to, to, to get these courses required and embedded within, within those courses? Yeah. Um, I, I think it comes down to a few things, uh, just, uh, strong relationships, a little bit of, um, understanding, compassion, empathy for faculty, uh, and then also just, um, options. So uh, kind of dive a little bit deeper into those. So uh, I think we have strong relationships with faculty on our team. And those uh, have had been built long before I got here. And I think that was huge. And I think um, for anyone on the call that's thinking about this, just being able to map out your own relationships around the, the college or, or the institution, I think is you know is important to do just to know who are your um, advocates and who are the ones that you can you can go to. So the, the relationships were, were, were number one. Um, I think also understanding from your faculty, what are things that are possible? What are things that are absolute deal breakers? And I think one thing I'll just mention for us is um, class time, forget it. It's not gonna happen. Like if we ask for class time, like we're on terms, quarters. We have 10 week quarters. They have so much information to pass to students. And this is where the understanding, compassion, empathy, kind of all put that together. Um, like, there's so many reasons to, to um, what's the word, sort of get annoyed or upset about why can't we do X, Y, or Z um, working with faculty. And, and, I, and I get that, I understand. I think in this situation is just knowing what are the limits, what are the things that we can and can't do. And I think for, for us, that was one. And so that's where we come up with options. What are the different things? What are the different uh, possibilities of a requirement? And so we came up with three different options and presented them to, to the department heads and the dean. And um, 
So it's helping them to feel as though it's like not it's only this way or or nothing, right? So it, it gives them a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more um, say in the matter, I suppose. Uh, it's it opens up discussion. Um, so uh, and then the last kind of tied to the relationships, I think. Um, you know, our, our dean, uh, she at the time, uh, we have a new dean now, and, but fortunately he's fully on board with what we're doing. The, um, it, she had a, a, a saying of well-educated and career ready. And I'm sure half the people on this call probably have the same saying from their, from their institution. But um, she really believed that and she walked that talk. And I think she uh, also played a role in, hey, let's have, let's have the conversation. So I remember distinctly having a meeting with faculty, department heads, uh, the dean, several associate deans, and presenting, hey, here's what, we're, what we'd like to see happen. Let's have the conversation. And that um, opened up the doors for, for us to, to move in this direction. And then it was phasing this out. We didn't start with three. We started with one. Mm -hmm. And we sort of piloted that. And we chose our biggest advocate because um, that was going to give us maybe the best, best chance of success. And um, yeah, and then that was successful, fortunately. And then we built out a second one, built out a third. And this was all in you know conversation with our undergraduate programs um, committee. And so honestly, at this point, it's, it's as official as it's going to get. And it's, um, it's part of the, the curriculum. Oh, and I forgot to add that it's weighted as part of the grade for these courses which honestly I wasn't even expecting or asking, but I think the faculty members felt as though if, if, it's, if it's that important, it's part of my class, like I wanted to make it sort of um, a little bit more official. So it's not, you know, 3%, 4% for another. Um, uh, one of them is, is maybe up to 10%, which I, it's incredible, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. There, there's a question that came through um, and, and perhaps, you know, Tony, you may have some thoughts on it too, given that you exclusively serve uh, graduate students. But I think related to your to your initiative, Gene, there was a question about what about for graduate students? So any, I, I know the courses, I believe the courses that you're speaking to are for undergraduate business students, but any thoughts on how that type of initiative could perhaps be uh, modified or implemented in a grad graduate business environment? Uh, yeah, so our program is for undergraduates. Uh, I think there's, um, you know, we have the thought, we still have the thought of what it might look like at a graduate level. We engage our graduates in career education in a different way. We work with them pre-matriculation with assignments before they get to campus, and then we're uh, integrated into orientation. We also have other partners within the, the college. Uh, we have four centers of excellence that do an incredible job of offering programming on the career education side, as well as the sort of um, getting speakers and um, experiential learning opportunities. So there are, I, I wouldn't say, I, just different program elements at the graduate level than the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. And so in our, our, our college is 95% undergrads. And so I think we started, um, uh, we started with that larger population. Um, so I, I guess all that to say, like those conversations are, are TBD and, and what that might look like. But um, right now uh, it, it is for the undergraduate population. Yeah, that makes sense. Tony, do you have anything like maybe even just speaking to engaging yeah. faculty in general? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a challenge here at Rady. We do not have any required career courses. Um, and, you know, to get a required course in a graduate program, you know, takes a lot of work. So it's mostly not going to happen. Um, so the one thing I would say, kind of to Jean's point on the relationships, I think what it comes down to is career center staff need to be really influential. Um, I think you can't assume that faculty understand the work that we do or how we think about it or why we think it's important. I think, you know, most of them, of course, do think that getting jobs is important and all of that. But um, I think being able to really talk to them, maybe, you know, do a roadshow, get in a faculty meeting, find the influential faculty so that you can explain to them what the strategy is, what the engagement's like, why you're doing this. 
And then I think it would really be up to you to find out where are the natural synergies. So um, I'm not going to go to, um, I don't know, a data analytics professor and say, can I come talk about XYZ career stuff? I'm going to look at the curriculum and see where there's some natural opportunities for us to insert some content. Uh, so a good example is we have a master's in finance program and the executive director teaches a professional seminar course. And um, he brings in people, high CEOs of finance companies to talk about their own career path. And so we are able to get one of his class times to talk about interviewing. Um, and so we're able to, it's a required course, we're able to come in and do an interviewing prep workshop for everybody in the class. So there may be other courses. I know some programs have like a communications class or um, there may be other parts of the curriculum where you can see a natural uh, synergy with a career topic. And so then you could influence the faculty to maybe um, either you know, let you come in. But like Jean said, you know, it's often hard to get FaceTime because they have so little FaceTime with students. Um, but maybe it's an assignment is something to do with with career or something like that. So um, I think really kind of working with your faculty to help them understand what, you know, our strategy is and how we're working with students. But then how can you do that? And I think, you know, it's Maybe because they're the faculty, people might rely on them to come up with the idea. But I think if you could go to them and say, here's the class you're teaching, and here's where I think we could embed some of this that would be beneficial to students, but it's also serving you know, their purpose as well. That seems to be um, working on some levels here. Yeah, I, I think one thing I did fail to mention is um, we we do work uh, so our, our MBA population has a um, an MBA seminar that uh, it's gone through some changes, but um, so we have interacted with the the instructors and the faculty who are um, kind of overseeing that seminar, and we've uh, worked with them to build in um, career education into those. And that's a you know again it's gone through some different um, iterations, but you know basically a, a weekly. Uh, one to two hour um, seminar that that all the MBA students are are participating in, and then I would also just look at what are the co curricular elements. If you're you know not looking at curricular, then what are the co curricular ways in which you could figure out uh, how to talk to you know th those the people managing those those programs or or those sessions to to embed as Tony was suggesting embedding these. Um, these kinds of activities or um, just nuggets of um, of career into into some of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And one other quick thing, you know, that Jean made me think of is um, using the technology. Um, our programs all have Canvas pages, and the executive directors allow us to have career content on the Canvas mm -hmm. site as well. So even though it's not an assignment or whatever, we can put content there also for the students. Yeah, that's great. I think this kind of all flows into the next question that I wanted to ask. And, and you both really have mentioned this theme of, um, Tony, I love how you said it, you know, be influential and be comfortable with that and telling your story. And can you both, you know, dig into how you are partnering with other stakeholders in your in your college. And I know we talked about faculty specifically and, and Jeannie started to mention some of the co-curricular ways, um, but I'd love to dig into that just a little bit if you have advice or thoughts. Yeah, I, I talked a whole bunch last, Tony. Do, do you wanna? <laughs> sure, wanna go ahead? sure, I can jump in. Um, again, I think at the graduate business um, level, it's a little bit different than what you would find at the undergraduate level. In some areas, we partner really closely with admissions. I think if anyone heard the UConnect podcast um, where we talked about that, it's really important uh, because we have small programs that whatever students we're bringing in, those are the students that we work with on the kind of the career side. So 
having a voice with admissions is really helpful and we work really closely with them. We also do a lot of events with them, webinars, yield events for um, you know, new admits or preview days for prospective students. We do a lot of that because when people think about coming and spending over $100,000 to get a degree, they want to know that there's some return on their investment afterwards. So having the career team there to, to kind of share that is really helpful. We work a lot with our student affairs team um, who are kind of responsible for the student journey, like everything that happens while they're in the program. We work really closely with them. We work really closely with our alumni, of course, because, um, you know, some alumni want to work with us because they need a job, but also uh, they have great, you know, insights and advice for students. So bringing them into the clubs, um, into panels, speakers, um, things like that. And then I mentioned before, we do work closely with our student clubs um, and trying to kind of help them enhance what they're doing. Uh, we we kind of have a model where we work with the students. I have one coach and one of our employer engagement staff assigned to every student club um, so that we can work closely with them, either on helping present content, career content, or connecting them with employers if they want to bring people in to speak or, or do um, panels. So we work with lots of stakeholders. We work with also besides faculty, all of our internal departments like marketing and finance and IT and <laughs> all of those. And then we also collaborate with our undergrad central career campus, career center, as well as um, our engineering school and our global policy and strategy schools <laughs> have career centers. So we often will collaborate together on events and, and different things there too. And also our international student scholars office, you know, like there's so many. There's so people. many. I, like <laughs> Tony, are these relationships that, uh, you know, are you going out and having to kind of start these, these discussions? Are you seeking these out? Are people coming to you? Are you, I'm just curious, like how intentional, or is it just kind of always been this way? Because I think you know, in different scenarios, I think there's just different situations where sometimes they're in place and other times you just have to be super assertive and inten intentional about creating those kind of just starting discussions. Yeah. I think it's both. Um, I think there are just some natural synergies that happen. Um, for me, it's maybe a little bit different and maybe a little bit more of being intentional because, um, again, I've only been here a little over a year, but in that year, and besides myself, there are 12 staff positions. I hired nine people this year. Um, so mostly my whole staff is new. And um, many of the other teams at Rady also have a lot of new people. So we've been the directors. We've been very intentional about trying to collaborate um, on more things. Um, and then some things just happen naturally, you know, with the Central Career Center, of course, we're going to we're going to chat. But other things, when you think about like what's your strategy and what you're trying to accomplish, then you could think about, you know, who should I partner with right. to make those things happen? And so then some reaching out and making that happen. OK, thanks. Anything to add, Jean? Um, I think, uh, you know, when, when you're thinking about partnerships and, and with stakeholders um, trying to influence students uh, you know one thing that I that comes to mind is thinking about when can you get in front of students and when is that the most impactful and so you know for both undergrads and and graduate students I think um, you know before they even come to campus maybe even before they're deciding to come how can you make an impact, how can you influence that decision? And so like Tony, you know, we, um, I, I present to potential students, you know, prospects mm -hmm. and letting them know about how, you know, how our team is going to help, um, help them uh, with their, with their career and, and their search. I think the other point is around orientation and is there a way to set the tone early on with the students around either expectations or, or sometimes it, you know, and, you know, with undergrads, it's less about maybe expectations and more about just letting them know that you, you know, who you are, that you're there and that you care. Um, yeah. 
And I think for us, we, you know, orientation at the undergraduate level happens differently. And I think that's something that we, you know, that's a nut we haven't cracked yet, but I think, um, uh, it, you know, so that's, that's there for us to, to improve on, but at least at the, the graduate level, I think we're uh, very much ingrained into their orientation experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I think student organizations, um, those are huge because again, like, you know, this moves into the idea of influencer space, how less one-to-one, -one, but instead of one-to-many, and how can you, as a career services professional or as a team, work with people who can influence others? And I think student organizations is, is a way to do that. Um, and, and yeah, I mentioned recruiting and missions. We, we work with them um, and then trying to do a better job of uh, working with other stakeholders within the building who are doing industry stuff because there's an incredible amount of stuff that's happening and it's awesome. Um, and and how can we, uh, you know, communicate better? How do we collaborate better and even coordinate? I think, yeah, I'd love to get to a place. And we just talked about this. I don't know if it was earlier this week on the team of how, you know, coordinating better with other stakeholders and it, you know, like more isn't always better, you know, but how do we, because I think there's fatigue amongst students. There's so much stuff that's happening. And so how, how can we coordinate with others so that it's, it's a richer experience, maybe I'm not saying less experiences, right. And, and opportunities, but, um, but, but fleshing them out more fully, as opposed to, you know, one off here, one off here, one off here. And then students are like, okay, which one do I go to? And I think it, 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 um, that might be a frustrating experience for them. So, um, yeah, so partnerships, I, I, that's, that's where those are some of the things I, I think about. Yeah. Um, we, there are several questions and I did, before we kind of get into, um, the, the Q and A and thank you to those who have, who have, um, submitted questions. I did want to, technology has kind of been a theme and Tony, you talked a bit about, um, about it. And of course, you know, I certainly don't want to be too on the nose or anything, but I am curious if you both can speak to how you're leveraging technology or if there's anything more to share as it relates to scaling engagement. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of leave it, leave it there. Sure. Um, so I think, again, back to kind of that problem we were trying to solve, I think you know, in career centers, we have lots of different technology. So most places have some kind of career platform, Handshake or Grad Leaders or 1220. Um, so that's one platform that we need students in. We use 1220 and, you know, that's where students sign up for workshops. That's where they see jobs. That's where they make appointments. We need them in that system. But with, but then we have like online resources that we want them to go to, right? Like other vendors that we work with, like VMOC or something like that. Um, and then those are other platforms that they have to remember the URL to and their password and all of that, right? So, um, which is why the Uconnect platform is that good solution for us because of the integrations um, with all of those career platforms, with you know things like Vault and LinkedIn, and and um, we use um, Graduate for our alumni network, right? So all of those things already be being um, integrated in makes it so much easier for the student, and then it gives us one place to always send them. So instead of saying go to twelve twenty to set up an appointment and go to this to mm -hmm. find your resume, and sorry my light keeps going on and off. <laughs> um, or, you know, go here to find this document, we can always just say, go one place. This is the place you go, um, and then you can find everything. And so I think leveraging that kind of technology, and I know, you know, not everyone can do that, not everyone has the budget for that, but for us, that has worked um, in, in getting people on the same page. Um, and we just launched six months ago. So, you know, we are seeing increased numbers. In fact, I looked this morning, you know, the first four months we were averaging about 850 users a month and now we're over 2,200. So I think, you know, we are seeing movement. We are seeing you, students use that information 
and being able to find what they need when they need it. That's the, you know, what they need when they need it is everything. You just summarized. <laughs> Anything to add, Jean? Yeah, I think, you know, technology is a is a huge part of the strategy. And I think it needs to be not, not just, I'm not just talking about, you know, my career center, but um, I think for everyone, I, and, and I understand like it, you know, it, it takes funds. And I think that's a, a different conversation, um, which by the way, if you're not leveraging donors, mm. got to do it. Um, so maybe, I don't know, actually, maybe that's a different webinar. If you Definitely a, another topic. To yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, we, I think we have, <clears throat> the institution has a responsibility to at a bare minimum help with equitable access to resources. And the reality is that we have many students that for a variety of reasons, don't want to come to the career center. Some of them can't come to the career center. Like think about how many of the students are working or, um, you know, childcare or, or, you know, whatever the reason is they, they can't make it. We have to, we have an obligation to uh, ensure that they have access to things. And, and without that technology that I, I don't know how, how you do that, right? Like, cause I'm not going to be working at 10 o'clock at night, you know, in the career center. So, um, so that, that's it. So technology has been huge. Um, you know, we, we launched our Uconnect platform on January. And I think the, the biggest, you know, for us, it was, you know, funny, Tony, you were talking about your websites for prospective students. I thought we were the only one, <laughs> but that's absolutely true. Like I with like, they, that's exactly what they said. Like the the users for perspective students. I said, well, that doesn't really help me. I mean, it does. We all want we all want more students. You know, we, of course, we want students, but you know, current students I think are are our number one priority. And so, how do we make that a better experience? And and that's the that was the biggest reason why um, the biggest reason. But I think the the another reason was how do we make that a better experience for the students and the idea of personalization at scale for our students was, that was it. Like, I'm interested in finance. Well, go to the finance page. You get all the finance alums from our people grove. You get all the jobs and internships from Handshake. You get the events like all tailored for you. That's, that's what the Gen Z student expects. And I think we needed to, you know, we, we need to meet them there. And if you don't, you're, as my daughter say, like you're from the 1900s. I don't want to, you know, think that way. I don't want a career. I don't want to be a career center from the 1900s. <laughs> right. um, even the 2000s, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so it's a, it's a huge piece for us. And yeah, just like you, Tony. Like our, I mean, I looked up this morning, 384 percent increase in users in the month of January from the prior January 2022 compared to January 2023. We had a 384 percent increase in users. 798% increase in page views. So I don't know about anyone else, but I like that. <laughs> it's a good number. I, I love sharing that with the college, which I did. Yeah. And getting emails back like, hey, that's incredible. And that's what builds confidence with other stakeholders that, hey, they're spending resources wisely. Mm -hmm. They're spending their time wisely. Um, you can show it. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. And here's the data to, yeah, to, to, to show that. So, yeah. Um, on kind of related, I'm going to launch just a quick poll question as I get into the last 10 minutes of questions. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Uconnect, how we can potentially partner to help help you scale engagement in the ways that Tony and Jean have, uh, let us know so we can just follow up appropriately. There was a question in the chat first question. So I want to answer it. And, and I know that we spent a lot of time talking about um, defining engagement and scale earlier. So let we'll rely on the recording a bit for that. But maybe just briefly on like how you think about defining um, success and what are the metrics used to monitor progress would be great. Yeah. So we've created the okay. dashboard. We have a dashboard. Um, and it captures the last four to five years worth of data. And we have a lot on it. And I was actually asking Tony for advice. Sir, sure. like, how do we narrow this down? Because I've got like, <laughs> it's like a hundred rows. Like, honestly, it's a lot. And some of the categories, we do just keep track of advising numbers and 
handshake profiles and and logins. Um, we keep track of our fund our fundamentals program, and I think the reason you know for engagement for us we're we are engaging with all students through fundamentals. Like every single student, we are reach we are you know we're we're connecting with them through that, um, and so we. I, we still want to keep track of what does engagement look like in all these other services and programs because we want to be good stewards of our resources and time. And so how do we look at things over, you know, some long, longitudinal from year over year, term by term, to have a better sense of, hey, why did that number drop? And is there an explanation? At least have the conversation. And so having this dashboard has really helped. And you know, a new one for us is website and newsletter engagement, right? Because now we have Uconnect that is, is helping us with that. Um, we keep track of collaborations with faculty members, whether that's, you know, allowing us to come in with guest speakers or if uh, faculty members are wanting to us to come in to give a workshop on, you know, interviewing, whatever the case may be. Um, and the newest one, which I'm super happy about the progress honestly need to figure out where we go from here, but it's student engagement relative to college demographics. So mm -hmm. an example of that is, hey, how many uh, students that uh, identify as, as Latinx are coming in for uh, an appointment relative to what percent do they make up of the college? And so we're looking at that number and the delta to see where are we doing better than others? and then. I think the, the big question for us is, okay, what next from there? But, you know, we're doing it. I'm happy we're doing it. It's a start. So let's, let's you know, let's, uh, let's go on from there. Yeah, I can just add on to that. Uh, yeah, I think the career office has a lot of data. And what I would sort of challenge people to do is really think about, again, what are your goals? And what data makes sense to share with whom? And what's the narrative that goes with it, right? Because just giving people numbers doesn't usually tell the story of what's happening. Um, so we do collect the regular things. Like, you know, we monitor number of one-on-one -on -one coachings. We also look, though, at distinct number of students um, that are coming in because those are two different things. We, of course, look at our workshop attendance and who's doing that. Um, just like Jean, we're looking at who's interacting with our system, who is um, uploading an approved resume, uh, who's giving us a status in the system. Um, so all of those things, because they can help us see how students and if students are engaging with our office. We do look at the website engagement. Um, Uconnect does have lots of um, analytics, so you can look at the particular resources people are accessing, the particular pages, things like that. Um, and that's not something that we share out with people, but it, we use it on our team to sort of inform the way that we're putting content onto the website. We also have a rubric for students um, and this is something I realize is not really doable at a large scale, like thousands of students. Um, but we have um, something we started at ASU that I brought here to Rady is we do a red, yellow, green status for every single one of our students each month. And there we have two dimensions on that. One is, are they engaged with career in any of those forms? And how focused are they in their career goals? Mm -hmm. And based off those two dimensions, the coaches put each of their students in a red, yellow, green status. And every month we share that information with the executive director of the program. And we share all of um, you know, those metrics, the coaching, the workshop attendance, the resumes. Um, and we share that so that they can see overall how their students in their academic program are engaging or not engaging. And then we can uh, use them as influencers to help us get the students um, coming into the office or using the resources and that sort of thing. So those are some of the things that we're externally putting out. You know, we have other things internally that we use more for decision making and, um, you know, things like, I think Jean mentioned the website data, things like that you can use to then 
uh, you know, take to your leadership to support the money and the budget to continue that or to bring that on. Um, so we're definitely looking at those types of things. Some, you know, to help people understand what students are doing, but other things to help inform our decisions around resources and staffing and all of that type of thing. So much data. This one, yeah, that's, <laughs> so many resources, so much data. Um, yeah, no, but I love this idea of, um, you know, simplify, you know, who, who, what are you sharing and with whom and how are you sharing it? And even Tony, how you're taking so many various data points and simplifying it and distilling it into red, yellow, green, right? So you're not asking people to synthesize, you know, the data on your behalf. Um, before there's just we probably have time for one more question. I wanted to just um, plug a couple of things because there are questions that are related. Um, first, I wanted to give a shout or a plug for Tony's Career Everywhere podcast episode uh, that went live, gosh, maybe four weeks ago or so, um, where she really dug into their partnership with admissions. Um, I've asked Zach, there he, look at that, on cue, <laughs> got it in the chat. It's like, it's like we're uh, communicating or something. Um, and I also want to highlight that Gene and his colleague, Jessica, uh, will be talking about their program. It's called the Lundquist Foundational Program. Lundquist Career Fundamentals. Fundamentals. Thank you. Um, so that podcast episode will be coming out probably in about six weeks, four to six weeks. Um, so be on the lookout. Um, you can subscribe to the Career Everywhere newsletter to get make sure you're notified when that drops. So super last question. Um, any advice on how to increase attendance to workshops? I think that's, you know, probably a, a common question. I would tie it, find your anchors. Who, who are groups? Could be a student club. Um, maybe there's a class. How can you find a, a, a group of students um, to be sort of the anchor for that event? I think, you know, this idea of one-off events, like if it's a well-known organization, yeah, you're not gonna have any problems. Uh, otherwise, I think there's there's just a, a lot going on at the, at the, you know, at the institution and there's so many choices. Um, so I would try to find, uh, you know, this, this anchor group that, of students that you can get to come and, you know, be the core of, of an event. Yeah, real quickly to add on to that, I agree. I think if you can find the students who are influential with their classmates and employ them to help you, that goes a long way. Um, I think sometimes incentives help. We often have our workshops at lunch or at five o'clock. So we try to offer food um, because we know students have one hour to get lunch and they don't have time to go get lunch and come to a workshop. So if we can offer food, um, we do that. Um, and then I think the last thing I would also say is, uh, you know, I think there's a real shift in just, you know, away from this idea of just telling students what they need to do and really helping them understand why it's beneficial to them. So I think that comes down to maybe the marketing of what it is you're trying to do to help students understand how it's going to help them versus like just come because you need to know how to do this um, but really helping them see here's how it's going to benefit you and here's how it's going to help you and the other thing that we try to do on our workshops is really make them more applied so students are coming and listening to an hour lecture but rather, you know, can we deliver 20 minutes of content and then give students a chance to practice whatever it is we're doing? So those are some ways. Um, and, you know, hybrid still, we find that if we offer a hybrid, we get more attendance. We've been trying to do everything on campus to get people back on campus, mm -hmm. but we have noticed the fully in-person doesn't get as many as kind of the hybrid. I'm not going to lie. Food will get me <laughs> those places too. So I think that's good. Um, I know we are one minute over. Tony, Jean, thank you so much. You two just, you know, dropped so many golden nuggets of wisdom, as I like to say. 
um, a lot of a lot of good secret sauce in there. So thank you. Is it okay if folks follow up with you on LinkedIn if I share? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I'll yes. You know, I'll share LinkedIn profiles and in, um, in the follow up. So truly, thank you. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday and a great end of the week and a fantastic weekend. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, everyone.